Well, this is the third annual uh, Emergency Preparedness Expo. And the purpose of this is to bring our partner agencies, not only from the county departments, the 14 ind individual fire departments, vendors, the American Red Cross, and, and so forth. And it gives the, the general public the opportunity to see what kind of emergency services we provide and to receive a whole lot of information on emergency preparedness, especially during this time of the year. Well, every year we usually have a, an emergency safety day uh, here at the store in October. And uh, this year was a little special uh, circumstance in that we, uh, uh, we talked to Mary Ann, uh, came to us and said they'd be interested in setting up their, their expo here. And of course, we were thrilled to hear that. And as you can see, this, is, this has been you know, quite a, an exposition of uh, safety and emergency preparedness hazmat. Um, it, it's just been a great day for us here. We've had very good participation from, from the crowd. Home Depot and their management staff have been absolutely superb in offering their facility and I think the residents need to know what the limitations of their emergency services are. I think it gives them an opportunity to start to do some personal preparedness and some family preparedness which is extremely important. Uh, and it does give them an opportunity to see exactly where their tax dollars and their donated dollars, for an example, to the individual fire companies go. Union Bridge uh, Fire Company would, gave us the opportunity, they, they participated, so they actually have a rescue squad, um, and, and they showed people exactly what is involved in automobile extrication when somebody's trapped in an automobile accident. We basically simulated the scenario as if we would pull up onto an accident and we would have someone trapped. First of all, we would do a, a scene size up. We would look for any hazards around the vehicles, such as fuel, oil, any electric wires or poles, trees, anything that may impair our ability to perform a rescue. What happens next is someone would be placed in command, which is usually the first, the, uh, first arriving unit, or it could be the second unit arriving in, uh, such as the squad. If I was in the front seat, I would then take command. Next thing we would do, we would set up an operations officer. They would be in charge of the rescue itself, where a command is actually in charge of the whole scene. By doing that, the rescue officer then will decide on his point of attack, on how he's going to assess, gain access to the patient. What we would do at that point, we would then try to make access to the patient to at least prioritize their condition to see if we need to grab and go, such as if the vehicle would be on fire or if they're getting ready to pass. In that situation, we would basically yank the person out as quick as possible. The biggest thing that to remember when we perform these tasks is we do not want to cause any harm to the patient. So that's why we take the steps in the stabilization, disconnect the battery, that way the airbags don't deploy. Any way possible that, that we can you know, keep it a safe and um, efficient operation. In this scenario, we had a stable patient. So what we have done, we performed the ultimate extrication. We removed all the doors, we removed the roof, and we also performed the dash roll. By doing the dash roll, what that'll do, that brings the dash and rolls it up off of the patient's lower extremities. Say, for example, if it would have crushed down onto them, that gains us access. We utilize that by using the hydraulic rams laying there on the ground. It's basically a long telescoping ram that shoots out. Uh, to remove the doors, we use the jaws of life which is basically a big jaw that will extend and compress to shear the metal away. And then for cutting off the roof, we utilize the O cutters or the hearse cutters. They cut the A, B, and C post around the vehicle. That allows us to pull the roof off of the vehicle. When you do that task, you always got to remember to cut the seat belts. And for cutting the windshield, we basically used your simple sawzall. Uh, before performing that task, we would cover up our patient with a blanket or a sheet. That way, no glass or anything like that would get on them. By doing those tasks, once we have everything removed, then that gains access for the EMS personnel as well as, well as any of our rescue personnel that, that may be needed. Most of us have training in the either EMT or first responder. 
Uh, that is part of the requirements to ride the squad. Once the, the patient is loaded into the ambulance, the care is then turned over to them and basically then that, that would be the end of our operations unless they would need us for a, a LZ, a landing zone, for a fly out. Uh, if we were going to fly the patient to shock trauma, then we would bring in one of the helicopters from the state police and they would transport then the patient down to shock trauma or whatever facility that they would be going to. All the firemen here and rescue technicians that we have, this is a completely volunteer. Uh, these guys, they have spent many, many hours in training. Uh, these classes we take are through the University of Maryland. The Firemen's Association here in Carroll County pays for any of the training that we would like to take. However, we are not compensated for any of the time. This is completely volunteer for us. And to, to do a drill of this nature, to have the training of this, most of us are EMTs. That's roughly about 140 to 150 hour class now. We are rescue technicians, which is roughly a 60 to 80 hour course. Uh, firefighter ones, firefighter twos, fire officers as, my, as myself, these are all college level courses that these guys take. So it's an estimated probably three to four hundred hours of training before you're even allowed to do something like this. So it, it's definitely something I want the, the community to know that we need your support to, to help us because I mean you know, it, it takes a lot to run this operation volunteer. You know, we, we only get a certain amount of money from Carroll County. The rest, we have to have fundraisers, and we need the community to support to keep these guys involved, to keep the interest there. Well, I mean, first of all, it's a great event. And one of the biggest things with emergency preparedness is making sure you communicate with the community. And so this is a great opportunity for folks that are out shopping and getting ready to go back to school and all those kinds of things to uh, come out, get some good information, to know what to do in case of an emergency, even what agencies to call, things that different private companies are doing. So, you know, it's exactly the kind of outreach that makes all the difference when you have an emergency uh, situation. I gotta tell you, I mean, I think that um, our emergency operations in Carroll County are uh, comparable to those anywhere in the nation. I don't think our folks here skip a beat as far as having uh, our citizenry adequately prepared in the event of something calamitous. I mean certainly our 14 volunteer fire companies are amazing anyhow to think of what they're willing to do in the way of volunteer work. Uh, the equipment they have, the technical skill that they have is always very impressive. Uh, but it's also interesting to see a number of private companies uh, coming together and the way that our different uh, organizations in the community work together. Our folks at Emergency Services do a fantastic job of coordinating different things because one of the biggest challenges in an emergency is not each individual agency doing what they're excellent at, but it's how cooperatively and how effectively they work together. So these kinds of activities not only uh, highlight the individual capabilities of each organization, but that cooperative nature, how they work together and how they overlap. So uh, that to me is always the most impressive part of what goes on uh, here in the county. I mean, the fact is that our uh, emergency management department does a superior job in coordinating efforts amongst the, you know, the 14 volunteer fire companies that we have here and the various law enforcement agencies and such. I have a, a supreme confidence uh, in Carroll County's ability uh, to respond in the event something unfortunate does happen, whether it be, you know, from a natural disaster or whether it be you know, something that was man-made, man-precipitated. Carroll County Sheriff's Office, um, you always wonder what a canine unit is and, and how the dog reacts and what their job is. So it gave them an opportunity to try to understand uh, what the canine unit is and how they function and why they're so vitally important to the law enforcement operations of this county. The way that a canine bites is he locks on. The more the person fights, the harder he will bite because they, are, they, they have a drive in them, a prey drive, the way they hunt. When they get an animal, they hold it. When it fights, they hold it tighter. When that animal does not fight no longer, they release. We do have our suspect um, behind the, the, uh, the black vehicle over here, the armored vehicle. This is our key tool here to train our dogs. 
They want this toy, and the way they get this toy is they got to do something good. When they do something good, they get their toy, they get rewarded, okay? Um, we're going to begin this demonstration. I'm going to give a couple demonstrations on how we have, how much control that the canine handler has of the animal. Sometimes we'll send our animal, our canine partner, onto a suspect, and the suspect will say, I give up. Obviously, we do not want our dog to continue. So the dog will stop, and I can, if, if he tries to run away, the dog's gonna continue after him, or I can call the dog back to me. This is canine Buell. He's two years old, and he's from Slovakia. That's exactly where we got him. His training began six months ago. Um, he is an, a friendly dog, um, but never pet a canine dog without the handler's permission, okay? Um, they are very safe dogs, but when they see a suspect and they start getting into that mode where I'm going to have to bite this guy and hold him down, you know, it's, it's a different story. But he's a great dog. I have two young kids and he absolutely loves them. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old and he's very protective over them. Very. <clears throat> okay, we're going to do a quick demonstration. Bill? Fus? Good boy. <laughs> Suspect in the field. I need you to surrender to me now. I'll send my dog, he will bite. Sheriff's office canine unit. You in the field, surrender to me now. I'll send my dog, he will bite. I need you to put the weapon down, sir. Put the weapon down. I'll send this dog if you do not put that weapon down. Ready? Fuck it. God, good boy. Good boy. Suspect go to one knee. Go down to one knee. Stop fighting my dog. Out, foos. <clears throat> Seats. Bravo. Foos. Foos. Seats. Flat. Flat. This one here, you're gonna, you're gonna, I give up, okay? Flat. Sheriff's office, final warning. Surrender to me now. I will send my dog. He will bite. Prats! Prats! Boots! Prats! Blib! Stay right there. This next demonstration is going to show you how I have to give no command when he touches me pushes me or hits me, my dog will automatically protect me, okay? I will give no command. This is a reaction towards him. <clears throat> Plot. Blide. Blide. Plot. Push me nice. Push me. Go! Good boy, good boy, good boy. Stop fighting my dog. Stop fighting my dog. Out, boost. Boost, over here. Plots. Bravo. Okay, suspect, thank you.
Just want to thank uh, the emergency services folks. It takes a lot of uh, work to put these kinds of things together, and they still have their daily uh, routines in terms of uh, uh, reports that need to be done and grants that need to be pursued and those types of things. Uh, they put a tremendous amount of effort during emergency situations, but also in between because, you know, the thing about an emergency situation, looking back, it's always easy to know uh, what maybe you should have done or could have done to prepare. Trying to figure out what might happen, where it might happen, who it might involve. Uh, very, very difficult and uh, you know, they really do a nice job of, of anticipating that, but a lot of it is an extraordinary extra effort that they put in, so uh, very appreciative of that. You know, I think it's uh, a very interesting. There's a lot of equipment on display so that uh, you know, people can have uh, uh, an idea of where their uh, emergency services uh, tax money goes and what our volunteers are doing at the uh, volunteer fire department level with the monies that they raise. I mean, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, and, the, and the vendors are here that are uh, uh, involved intricately with uh, uh, helping people be prepared in the event of an emergency. So, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity for folks to come out and have a good idea as to how to be prepared in the event of the worst. Uh, so we're very happy with the turnout. Uh, we always want more people to come, but next year will be another opportunity for uh, hopefully more residents to come and see what their emergency services is all about. If anybody in the county wants additional information on emergency preparedness, they can contact our office. Um, the other thing that we do have is we have now have a, a very, very active uh, and interactive web page on Facebook um, so people can visit us there. And once again, we'll get a better, better turnout from the residents next year.